welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Thank you for joining us. Today's show features four police chiefs who are also graduates of the Massachusetts School of Law. Let's discuss the job of keeping us safe and law and law enforcement. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's first look at why you decided to become a police officer and some of that early training that you received uh, in the academy. Paul, why did you decide that you wanted to be a police officer? I, I can recall way, way back uh, that this is one of the two things that I wanted to do with my life. One was to be a police officer and the second was to be a teacher. Uh, fortunately, I've been able to accomplish both. Um, I, I joked when I first got sworn in as police chief that I used to run a, uh, a little bureau of investigation in the neighborhood, probably at about six or eight years old. So there had to be something that sparked it. And I think part of it was some public service. My grandfather was a firefighter in Salem for 42 years. And uh, I've been very fortunate uh, to be able to get on a, a police department uh, as such as Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, I've had a great career, and, and after law school, I've been able to teach at a couple local colleges. So what I've wanted to do, the two singular things in my life, I've been able to accomplish both. Now, how many years uh, now has it been that you've been police chief in Salem, Massachusetts? I'm starting my, uh, it'll be four years uh, in October, and uh, before that I was acting for about six months when the uh, previous chief was finishing up. So just about four years now, and uh, it's gone by pretty quickly. Kenny, why did you decide that law enforcement was uh, your future? Well, actually, I wanted to be a, a famous chef. That was my dream job. Uh, I actually went to a vocational school. I was learning how to be this chef that I wanted to be. I, was, I had applications into Johnson & Wells, Culinary Institute of America. Uh, but I come from New Haven, Connecticut. It's a large city, about 130. Uh, thousand in population. Small college there. I forget what the name uh, of it Yale is. Yale University. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there was a lot of injustices going on within the community. Um, and I would watch police do certain things that I think they should not have been doing. And um, I remember saying, this is not right. It's not, uh, th there's something that I feel like I should be doing. I don't know what. So this actually happened about 12, 20, 12, 30 in the morning. I was listening to the radio station and one of those commercials came on become a police officer, be all you can be, you can serve, this is, and it was like a calling. From that point on, all I wanted to do was become a police officer. And I wanted to do it to change uh, what I was seeing in the community, and I think that I succeeded. How many years ago now was it that you first became a police officer? Uh, about 21 and a half years. And how long has it been now since you've been a police chief? Uh, about six months. Um, and originally you were a police officer in New Haven? Correct. Um, New Haven's much larger community than we're <coughs> your police chief now. Correct. New Haven has a, a budgeted amount of officers of 500 officers, 130,000 population. I'm now in Millbury, Massachusetts, 13,000 population, and about 20 uh, full-time officers, 20 part-time okay. special officers. We'll come back later to the different dynamic between city versus country police officers and the poli uh, policing issues that are attendant with that. Lisa? Okay, mine uh, was a little unique. I, I was always gravitated for some reason to police um, work. Um, sounds a little goofy right now, but um, I like the, the shows on TV. I like the, um, the fact that I could challenge myself and, and also that, um, you know, the uniqueness of it. Um, what I found was a little difficult for me at the time back in the early 80s was that there were very few women going into this field and um, I found that you know, trying to find a job was, was going to be difficult. So I did go to school um, to become a police officer. I you know, took criminal justice training and what have you. And um, by some luck, I got offered a uh, position with the department that I'm still with. And I loved it. I, I, I found that it was very challenging, that um, you never knew what you were going to encounter. I work in a very small department. You you pretty much had to just depend on yourself and maybe a neighboring um, agency uh, to come and assist you. So um, to me, that was what I liked. I, I knew what my capabilities were. You learned to depend upon yourself and um, pretty much no one else because you didn't have anyone else. So, um, and, and as one of the very few women in the department, and still today there's very few women in law enforcement, uh, that path had to be pretty rocky at times. It, it was, yes. It was. I'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, so perseverance is important. You know, within, within my own department, but also with neighboring departments, um, it, was, it was quite difficult. Oh, sure, I imagine. Ron? I, uh, I, I got out of high school and joined the military, and uh, it was while I was in the military that I decided that this was the route that I wanted to take. Um, it, it easily translated to it. It, it's, it, you, it presents itself with the same opportunities, that same altruistic sense of being able to give something back, um, to make a difference, to, you know, and I know that everybody says it, and it's, it's almost become cliche for everybody as they, as they enter, I want to make a difference. But it's, it is true in the sense that everybody walks into this job, and they have this sense of purpose and they have this sense of why I, why are why I want to be here and why I'm here and the fact that they're you know um, that that when there's a line in the sand that's drawn that they they're the ones that that stand on that line when it's needed uh. well that it may sound altruistic but don't you have to have that attitude for the job you guys agree to do I mean you're you potentially could be shot or hurt at any point in time it can't be just for the money or the great benefits <laughs> that you guys <laughs> are doing this job. Um, don't you have to think, don't you have to feel, at least just to be able to do it on a regular basis, that there's got to be more value to it than simply the remuneration received? Yeah, and especially after graduating from, especially after graduating from MSL, I, I, had, the, I had the benefit of going to work part-time for a, um, a great, a fellow alumni, um, Brian Simino, and um, the money, obviously, that I could make doing that as opposed to the money making on this end of it uh, was it, it definitely it 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 presents itself as a stark contrast as to okay why are you here well definitely not for the money that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> now you're uh, have we determined whether you are the youngest police chief in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because I, I don't know that but you became a police chief at what age 38 which is pretty young for to be a police chief of the, of the department relatively young yeah it is um, now tell me about your education level before you entered the police force. We tend to think that, uh, at least in this area, and I think we may be uncommon in New England, is that we've got a highly educated police uh, force because a lot of them come with criminal justice majors or other majors from colleges. Uh, and then throughout both uh, their time in the police force and as well as otherwise, they're improving their education like you all did with your, your law degrees. Um, do, did you all have college degrees? Or were you uh, pursuing your college degrees when you started law school? I, I had just kind of an interesting hurdle that I got over for my first police job. I, I worked for a city in New Hampshire as my first police job. And when I arrived there as a 21-year-old, I was halfway through uh, Salem State University with a criminal justice degree. And when I was being interviewed by the police chief at the time, this was 1981, uh, and he asked me about my education, I gave what I thought was the right answer, that I'm going to continue my education. and. I want to get that degree, it's important. And I'll never forget, he said, we don't need college boys here, we need working cops. That was 1981. So I was there for two and a half years, and I was able to get back to Salem, Massachusetts, where I was from, and I continued my education there, which was something that I wanted to do. Uh, when I finished at Salem State, I, I took uh, about a year and a half off, and I continued on to get a master's. And then uh, by that way, I was pretty well into my career 10 years in, and I was fortunate enough to get a slot at the FBI National Academy. And I've done a number of in-service trainings with uh, federal and state law enforcement. That's been phenomenal. The, the training that's out there is, is terrific. Can you tell me a little bit about that training? Because I know both you and Ron have been through the academy. I mean, it's not, it's not training available to all police officers. Right. Uh, but it is specialized, and it does really set you apart and, and give you some qualifications for it does. Uh, yeah. law enforcement. Yeah. In 1935, the FBI uh, put a program together for uh, international and national uh, police officers who are of, of executive rank, generally the captains or chiefs or commanders of some sort. Um, in April of 1997, I was able to secure a slot. It's very highly competitive. Uh, it's an 11-week program. It's run at Quantico. Uh, you train with the FBI agents. You take executive-type classes. I took everything from uh, public speaking to criminal profiling to criminal investigation, forensics. Um, and after 11 weeks, you really felt as, as though the FBI really had a, an investment in you, uh, and I came home for about six weeks, and I started law school, and it was um, it was a bit of a whirlwind, uh, but it's something I look back on now that that um, it has definitely made me uh, a better police officer and a better police executive. With a this as a police chief now, um, you want your officers to have um, college degrees, advanced degrees. Do you encourage the education uh, uh, equivalent that that 
wasn't encouraged at least early on. <laughs> I, do, I, I do, and it, it, is, it does stand in stark contrast to when I first started in 1981. Um, I would actually prefer that at the entry level you either have um, some type of college degree, whether it's an associate's and, and working towards a bachelor's within a certain period of time. I also think there needs to be a level playing field uh, for folks that join the military right out of high school. I think they, they deserve and, and should get some credit for that and then also work toward a, a more formalized education. I'd like to see us make that a standard. Uh, I know in Massachusetts there's talk about going to a police officer standard in training that uh, many other states do. I think Massachusetts, frankly, lags behind in some of the training for police. I know we're 49th out of 50 states for police training. There's been some more budget cuts, and, and uh, Mass Chiefs have, have really stood behind uh, increasing money for training. Um, that has been an unsuccessful fight, as has been the so-called Quinn Bill, uh, which paid police officers for their education and what they've attained in the classroom. And I think it's a shame that the state walked away from that as well. They're not supporting that now as, w as, uh, as they have in the past? They have not. They've actually walked away about two years ago. They, they cut the program. So anybody hired after uh, July 1st of 2009, unless the individual municipality uh, wants to pick it up, which very few are doing, um, I think that it's not going to break today. But I think what's going to happen is over time, uh, I, I, I worry about policing in Massachusetts, that the educational standards will fall, and I worry about the quality of policing falling. And, and I think that, uh, as I said, it won't break today. I, 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 I could speak to an editorial that was done in one of our local papers that said basically that the police are overpaid and that people will, will be willing to do it for a lot less. I think that's probably true, but be careful what you ask for. There's people that will take this job for one half of what we're doing it for, but is that really the, the what we want, the quality of the candidates? Now, Ron, you were in the military uh, first, or did you go in the military after college? Because no, I, yeah, I joined straight out of high school, and uh, I was, I was in the, I was, I, I joined um, uh, during the first Gulf War, and it was, um, I joined a two-year, they were doing a special two-year enlistment for the Navy, so I signed up for a two-year enlistment in the Navy at the time, and w it was, it was while I was in the service that I took the civil service exam uh, for Mansfield, and and so then, at some point, then you came on to Mansfield and then you pursued both your college degree while a police officer? Yes, yes. Which trained you better, did you think, your military training or your college training? Both and neither. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. It's, it, 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 you need, you need, I'm, I'm, I'm with Paul all the way on this, it's you need a college educated police force. I think that after the, I think uh, the entire world after the 68 Democratic Convention witnessed the fact that you need an educated police force. You can't have, you know, I, I, you know, we, we don't need any, we don't need any college boys here. We just want street cops. It's, I, I shudder at that thought. Um, I, you want people that are going to walk, and and you want people to basically. The benefit to college is the fact that it break, it helps to break tunnel vision. It also makes people more diversified, and the, the benefit also to the military now, today's military, as opposed to. 30, 40, 50 years ago is, is that it is a more diverse military. Is, is that when you, you know, let's face it, six months, I was, I was in the Persian Gulf for six months on a, on a ship with, you know, uh, 400, uh, 400 other people. There were, you know, black, Hispanic, white, everybody, everybody got along wonderfully and you really got a good feel for how other people thought and how other people felt. And if you can't get along in that environment, then you just, you know, you're not going to get along at all. And um, it, it, I would suppose, I would say that it's <coughs> the combination of both, the combination of both. Good, Kenny. I'd like to comment on the, uh, the FBI Academy. I, I did not attend the FBI Academy, but there is another, uh, we call it chief school mm -hmm. uh, for executive officers. I went to PERP, and uh, some of us couldn't go to the FBI Academy because of the long-term commitment. Uh, as you know, I, I have four kids, and um, they are in my custody, and it was difficult for me always to, to go away. So PERF, I believe the acronym, acronym is uh, Police Executive Research Forum, uh, is a three-week program in Boston, um, and they bring in the heavy hitters. They bring in Brad, and they bring in all the previous police chiefs from big cities, and the professors are Harvard, from the uh, Harvard Business School, and they teach principles of business um, as it relates to policing. Um, I think it's a, uh, I think it's imperative. When I was searching to become a police officer, a police chief, they would always say, FBI Academy, they at least prefer that or some acceptable alternative. So 
those that are looking to become a police chief, I think you really need to seek out these courses. I think it costs about $7,000. The New Haven Police Department paid for it out of grants from uh, the government, and they sent about 10 people. And do your police departments pay you for the 11 weeks you're away at the FBI Academy as well? Okay. That's actually one of the requirements that the, uh, that the, that the FBI requires that one, uh, once, they are, once they make the offer to the municipality, actually the, uh, the FBI pays for um, one-way travel there, one-way back, and also everything else. But that's one of the requirements is that the municipality has to continue to pay the officer while they're gone. Now, Lisa, you had your college degree by the time you became a police officer? I had a bachelor's degree when I got hired in um, 1983, and then I pursued my uh, master's degree. And then um, probably about five or six years after that, I um, was able to, to get into law school. And the reason being was just the shifts that I worked. We worked a five and two at the time, and we worked, I basically worked three different shifts in, in that five-day period. Um, what, explain, because uh, a lot of people don't, what's a five and two actually mean? Five days on, two days off. But those two days on, what most people's regular two days are, they're not necessarily Saturday and Sunday. They're never Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> I don't think it was ever Saturday and Sunday. Uh, <coughs> it might have been Monday and Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, <laughs> what have you. So I did. I, I, then I came to Mass School of Law and uh, graduated from here in 99. Now, what about your training at the Academy? So now we're police officers. Is the training at the Academy sufficiently intense and um, sufficiently uh, sufficient, competent, that you guys feel that you were adequately trained when they put you out in the street, gave your gun and said, now go be a street cop. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny that you ask that. There's a, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. Um, one is that, that uh, when you go through all this training, which now is about 26 weeks, uh, some field training officers, when you get back to your departments, will say, hey, did you learn all that great stuff in, in the academy? Say, yeah, it was great. Forget everything. Now we're going to show you the job. That's one aspect of looking at it. I think it's important to note that um, somewhere around 30 years ago, and I, I'll speak particularly to Massachusetts, <coughs> Uh, there was a big change in the, the, the training of recruits. Uh, there was a heavy emphasis 30 years ago on physical fitness. It was push-ups, sit-ups, running. It was very physically demanding with some classroom. Uh, I think that that's actually flip-flopped today. Physical training is still important, but now the, I think the education is so more diversified uh, with liability, uh, with, with uh, uh, interpersonal skills and speaking skills. I think that the quality of the training today has improved tremendously from, from when I went to the academy. That's the feedback that I get from the recruits. It does. It, it tends to, it, what it does is it, it, all it does is provide a base so that when they can get out, when they do get out of the academy, and what most police departments have, a, a, we have a 12-week FTO program. And I'm sure that most, pe yeah. yeah. Most people have, a, um, a 12, most PDs have a 12-week FTO program. What's FTO mean? Uh, field Training Officer okay. Program. And basically, it's separated into three sections. There's the three, the first third is <coughs> basically all they do is observe. The second third, they observe with somebody that accompanies them. And then the last third, they basically are, uh, they operate on their own for the most part. And realistically, that's supposed to build off of what they've already picked up in the academy. Okay, great. Kenny? I think uh, Paul is dead on in respect to when you come out of the academy, a lot of times you'll have a veteran officer, remember this is 21, 22 years ago, that will say something along the lines of, forget everything you learned, just forget about it. Now this is the real streets, this is how you uh, uh, become a police officer. But what I used to tell my cops in roll call <coughs> is that you remember that training because that's the training that will save your life. Uh, four of my friends died in the line of duty uh, over 21 years, so every five years a cop died, uh, shooting or hit by a car and so forth. But it was those basic police officer training techniques that when you approach a door, you don't approach it from an angle where they see you, that you approach it from the side so when they open the door, they, you don't, they don't see the police officer. Um, that has saved a lot of cops' lives. It has saved my life. I, I was a SWAT guy and tactics. I used to see these young officers come out and they would lack tactics because they would say, you know, when I was a sergeant, sergeant, you know, they said this isn't, you know, the academy isn't what it is. This, this is the real world. And I would always tell my cops, to this day, always resort back to your basic police officer training. Um, and that training would follow up in-service training yearly, which I was surprised when I came to Massachusetts. I, the first thing I said, oh, okay, when is our scheduled in-service training? And they said, chief, uh, we have standards, but <laughs> there's no money for it. 
So uh, really, there is no annual training that's funded. It's gone from it's gone from around five or six million dollars. Uh, it's been cut now down to about two and a half million. And what the state has said is that there's certain things that you have to do. It's an unfunded mandate that now there's a, this 32-hour block of things that you have to do, and we can no longer pay for it. Basically, they pushed it back onto municipalities who are also strapped for cash. And yeah. that's that's the problem. Yeah. It's actually the unfunded mandate has become the running gag among amongst the uh, at the Chiefs Association and among the, uh, at the Mass Municipal Association as well. And the fact that the state keeps dumping all these unfunded mm -hmm. mandates on the town, city, and the municipalities, and requiring them to fill the void while at the same time raising the standards. Yeah. We have to take a brief break. For 25 years, the Massachusetts School of Law has been training great lawyers and building great relationships. Joining MSL was more than just making friends. It was becoming a part of a family, which makes it very difficult to leave. I don't want to leave MSL. We didn't want to leave MSL ever. Best decision ever. We love MSL and we don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law. Great lawyers, better people. Come join our family. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. At some point, you all decide to go to law school, uh, but you're not using your law degrees in the traditional sense that most people would see it as a, as a practicing lawyer. Um, so tell me how law school and law enforcement work together for you, Lisa. Okay. It, sort of like uh, Chief Tucker, I, I wanted to be a police officer, and I also had this dream, I guess, um, of being an attorney. Um, so I fulfilled that, but I don't really use it. Uh, I find that it, it helped me become um, more structured and uh, more goal oriented and um, much to the chagrin of my officers and everyone who knows me um, I, I'm actually just I, I analyze things to death um, to the point sometimes that I actually drive myself crazy yeah I've been there too <laughs> <laughs> as foolish as that sounds nope. and there's no simple answer to a question anymore I mean life has changed drastically in that aspect but I, I took what I learned at Mass School of Law and also in my other schooling and what I continue to learn to just form a basis for how I go about my daily activities, um, my, my job as a police chief, but just, just how I do things. Um, it certainly has changed the way I look at things. And the law degree must be pretty valuable for your positions because we have 11 police chiefs across the country that have law, that have law degrees from Mass School of Law and in fact are in that top position. I mean, you must have, from the time you started, decided to go to college and finish the rest of it, you must have just been in school virtually all your life here. Yeah, the, run, the running gag in my house is, is that I actually, um, I, <laughs> I actually, when I finished up at MSL, I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm online one day and I, I see the fact that George Washington University is doing online courses and I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> cute. So I, so I type out this, I type out, fill out the for form and everything and, uh, that came in the mail, and it, the, that was a that was the that was a proverbial pipe bomb with my wife. She Jen didn't take it well. No, you would have thought that that was another woman's phone number. That she <laughs> found. It was. I am not going through any more school. It was. I yeah. I started. Um, I, I started. I finished through police academy, and it was about six months later. I started taking classes uh, at night, and basically, it was about a decade straight that I was I was in school I, I went through I got my bachelor's degree then I went uh, then I decided to get my master's degree and once I was done with that I decided to jump in with MSL as well and uh, it was it was a very nice roller coaster ride <laughs> and how do you think it's improved you or, or not improved you as a as a police chief as a I, I can I can honestly say I don't think I'd be here without it um, I don't think I'd be sitting in the chair in the office that I'm sitting in without the degree from MSL uh, there is it it just it it helps to round you out it helps to it, it it's hard to explain from the time that you from the time that you start especially law school to the time that you finish law school 
your whole way of thinking, analyzing, and structuring things, like Lisa sure, says, yeah. changes. It's you all of a sudden you have now have a, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end to every single situation, and then the multiple variables that come into play in each yeah. one, and then how to navigate each one and to get down to that uh, to the bottom line. Um, it's you know I it it's been invaluable. It really has. Now, Kenny, you did it in a even as as difficult as Ron's journey is. You were commuting two hours from New Haven to get to law school as well, so you must have really, really wanted it. Yes, I, I really wanted it, and uh, I, can, I, I do want to make the statement that I didn't come onto the uh, department with a degree. Uh, I was in college, and I had to, okay, college or this $40,000 job uh, back then, uh, so I chose the job. Uh, but it took seven years to get a bachelor's degree because you, the rotating of the sure. shifts and so forth, and then I went to get my master's degree and then I decided to go to law school. For me, it has helped me think better. Okay, it was one of two plans. One, I wanted to become a ch police chief, but <coughs> it's very rare that you become a chief. And um, I was in a big department, 500 cops, and you know, to become a chief was pretty difficult. So my secondary plan was I was just gonna practice law. Um, so I became a chief, and even as a police lieutenant, before I became a chief, it has just helped me to think better. Uh, there's simple things that uh, we now see as MSL graduates that other people don't see. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, I'll have conversations with my commanding staff and they'll say, well, let's do this, chief. And right, I'll just pick up on it. We can't do that. I tell the uh, town manager, as I told in New Haven, the mayor, I've saved you thousands of dollars of money, you know, work money, uh, I'm sorry, of money uh, for not having to go to your legal counsel. Um, and right, there's probably no doubt about that if you think that, that at le your legal training, it's, if it's not just not going to legal counsel, but likely in uh, advising your officers, you've saved yourself exposure to, to God knows how many civil suits as a result of practices that might have gone unchecked with, by someone who didn't have a law degree and have some legal training. I was told by one of my, uh, by one of my, one of the board, of, one of the members of the board of selectmen. He said, "Oh yeah, we got a two for one. We got an extra town council, and we also got a police chief at the same thing. At, at the, you know, bargain basement price." <laughs> That's true, isn't it? So, Kenny, I didn't, I, I interrupted you before you finished. Searching for police. You chief were saving chief. the money. Police chief jobs. Uh, they, some of these jobs said, Juris Doctor preferred. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can, s you can see where that's. I'm sure everyone on this panel will uh, agree that back in the day, cops could go out and do a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? There was no legal ramifications. Now, this is a different time. Yep. We have lawsuits flooding in to uh, uh, cities and towns. So uh, I think the demand now is that our chief executives in policing must have some type of legal background. Mm -hmm. Paul? I have a couple of distinct memories that, that uh, really still jump out at me and will stay with me. One is uh, a conversation I had with my wife when I was thinking about going to law school. And I said, I really want to go to law school. I said, I, I really want to go. And I was in my, my mid to late 30s mm -hmm. at the time. And my wife asked me why. And I said, well, I just think it'll help me, it'll help me on my job. It'll help me further my career. And she said, well, why don't you do it? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to be 40 when I graduate. And she said, well, you'll either be 40 with or without a law degree. <laughs> and that actually spoke to me. And the, the, the second distinct memory I had is my very first night at Mass School of Law uh, was orientation. And I looked at Brian Gilligan, who's the captain on Salem PD. We went to school together. And I said, Brian, what are we doing here? What do you mean? I said, my son's playing an all-star baseball game tonight. It was August 13th, 1997. I said, it's the first game he's playing that I'm going to miss. I don't know if I can do this. And we just, it was one step at a time. It wasn't a sprint. It was a marathon. But it was a great race to run. And it was something that, you know, we have it. I think that now that I have this degree, and it's really dawned on me a few times that um, I think that there's, there is, uh, among the public, there's a respect for what it takes to get through law school. Mm -hmm. Whatever people think of, of law school or medical school, there's a certain respect that if you reach the finish line, that you finish law school, you get that Juris Doctor, you pass the bar, I think it brings with you some respect and some credibility. One other story that I have, a dear friend of mine who's a, a very honorable criminal attorney, he had told me a story about what I'm going to learn, and, and we've heard this a few times, that you're going to think like a lawyer. There is a tremendous amount of truth to that when you look at all sides of a problem. He had a case of, of a multiple offense drunk driver, and he was... He was trying to look at this, and, and I think most people looked at it and said, boy, you know, th this client, he's, he's, he's going away. He's, there's a bad ending here. He looked at it a different way. 
and he was able to go back and look at some of the previous convictions. And there was flaws in those previous convictions. So what could have been a fourth or a fifth offense was really a second offense. And people may look at that, but he, he protected that individual's rights, and he looked at it a different way, and that, that really spoke to me. Do you think, uh, just to, to, to jump off that, do you think because your legal training and your backgrounds at this point, that as chiefs, you have a greater ability then to potentially do justice in some of these cases where you might say, no, don't charge him with this, charge him with the lesser offense, or no, maybe this is a case that, that, that the, the facts are not going to warrant a, uh, a guilty at the end of the day, or not even close, so maybe we ought to let this one pass. I mean, because even someone getting arrested and having a record and all the rest being put through the system, it's an enormous burden on most people. Does, does your law degree, does that give you some ability to help in that way, to <laughs> sort of make I think that? It, it, it does and it doesn't. I'm looking at, listening to your question, and I'm looking at it from both avenues. Yes, I can say yes, it does. Um, as a true lawyer, I can answer and say yes, it <laughs> does and yes, it doesn't. But all joking aside, it does because um, you, you have that knowledge that you're bringing with you. But I have to admit that, you know, 20, 25, 30 years on the job, you also have that knowledge, um, you know, of the law oh, sure. from just doing the job. So, yeah, your legal, you know, your, I think my legal degree helps in some aspects and it certainly hurts in other aspects. Um, it drives people crazy. But I, I honestly can tell you that from 30 years doing the job that I bring that to the table too. I can add one more thing like that. Not only on the criminal side, but on the internal side, whether it be from a disciplinary mm -hmm. nature. We have 125 employees in my department and unfortunately sometimes police officers step out of line when they shouldn't. Um, you can make decisions that are very good decisions that are backed up at the state and the federal court level, which I've had to appear in, and fortunately we prevailed. <coughs> or you can make bad decisions and you can incur quite a bit of liability on your municipality. I, I have found that my legal training has, has really helped me to propel forward to make what I think are good decisions. Mm -hmm. There's an element of fairness and there's an element of your education. You put those together and you make the best decisions you can. I, I also have uh, what I call MSL moments sometimes. Our mayor, our city solicitor, and our HR director are all MSL grads. And we're in the room. I think it makes for a pretty formidable team. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm prou very proud to hear that, Paul. Uh, let me ask you about community and um, how they support their police departments and their police officers. We t oftentimes hear of friction between communities and their police uh, departments and their police officers. Um, what are your general feelings of with respect to those issues? I mean, obviously, in order to run a good department, it takes an incredible amount of community support. Uh, do you find that that support is often there, or is, is it is it a few people that, that cause the trouble and they the, the clanging bell gets the makes the most noise. Who wants to jump in that one? We, we could have a long show. Yeah. I was say, <laughs> you do only have an hour, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the community, for the most part, I mean, I think, I hope people would feel in my community, we support our police officers. We, most of us certainly know the risks that you guys are uh, undertaking on an everyday basis for our, on our behalf. I, I think that the first thing that needs to be understood, at least from my perspective, is from a, from a PD's perspective as a whole, I think the first thing that you need to understand is, is that there needs to be a level of transparency within the organization with the community. Um, you know, you can't, if you're going to act like you're some sort of a, a black op subdivision, then you're going to get treated like you're a black op subdivision. And you know, if, if, if you were open with the community and, and you discuss the problems openly with them and actually bring them into the fold when it comes to discussing most of the problems and the possible solutions, um, then you're going to find that the support's going to be there for you. I think you have to be careful sometimes that uh, there are going to be certain people that no matter what you do, that a certain, and I think it's a very small segment of the public, will question what you do. And I think a lot of the questions come from is something that Ron touched on because they don't know. Um, in our local n newspaper, there's a, the people have the ability to make comments after reach, and sometimes there's hundreds of comments. And I'll never forget, we had a barricaded subject, and. Uh, uh, it was a fairly lengthy hostage negotiation, and Channel 7 sent a helicopter. They spent about an hour up overhead, and the next day in the paper there were 10 or 15 comments. Why are the Salem police wasting gas on the helicopter, the police helicopter? If we had a helicopter, nobody told me. <laughs> but that just spawned more commentary. On the good side, my opinion is that there is a built-in reservoir of goodwill toward public safety. And I think that even small things that police officers do, give somebody directions with a smile, <coughs> treat people fairly. All you do is increase that reservoir of goodwill. Unfortunately, I get that letter every week where one of our officers was either rude to somebody 
treated somebody as if, you know, that, that, that they had done something wrong when they hadn't. And I think that those, unfortunately, sometimes carry the day, other than the 25 letters I get thanking us for doing something. In Salem, we have a tremendous amount of, of support. And I think a lot of it has to do with the way we run the department, not just me, uh, our, our command staff, and I, I think that that carries itself all the way through the department. If the tone is set at the top, I think that the department will follow. I'm just going to summarize basically what these gentlemen said. I think uh, they're on point with what they're saying. And I think there's a category for it, community-based policing, which is strong in New Haven, Connecticut, and that's what I'm bringing to Millbury, Massachusetts. It is imperative that the public trust their police officers. It's very different, and we all can understand, as a new recruit comes out, the first thing they want to do is jump in that cruiser. They look good, right? We all look good, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to just drive that cruiser, and, and I can remember the day, I was, when I was a rookie cop, I, I, you know, it, looked, it looked great, your car is clean, your shoes are shine, and you're just driving, you got your shades on. And it took a lot for us for the chief to say, you're hitting the street, you're walking. And we, we, first we were offended. We're like, excuse me? You know, we're new recruits. We want to get out there and bust through the doors. We want to make arrests. So, no, you're walking the beat. The value of that is tremendous. That, I am a product of that community-based policing. I practice it for 21 years. It's the trust that when I do something, they go, oh, back then, that's Officer Howe. Right. We know what he did was just because he's fair. When someone else who's not engaged in the community, no vested interest in the community, and they do something, they'll question it. I don't know what that, I don't even know that cop's name. Mm -hmm. What did he do? What, and so forth. They would come to me, uh, my informants and so forth, and um, the community. And a quick story is, I was in a situation where I was attacked. Someone tried to take my weapon. Uh, I was on the ground. I was bleeding from the nose. It was like a, a 25 people. Uh, I was uh, fighting for my life, and I'll never forget that day. And I was calling for help. They knocked out my partner, and just blood everywhere. And it resulted in the arrest of this individual who was a drug dealer. He was mad because I was shutting down his operation. The people went to court and said, we will not tolerate the abuse on our community-based police officers. And he got seven years in prison. If I was not connected with that community, no one would have shown up, and it would have been on the docket, and then they would have passed it on, okay, three years probation, whatever, you did seven years. And to this day, if I see that person, which I saw him two years ago, he said, how are you? Hello. He speaks to me, because the way I treated him was fair. No matter what he did, which was some bad stuff, it was fair. So community-based policing, engaging the community, vested interests, I think those are the key factors in uh, Let's talk a little bit about the danger that Kenny just uh, mentioned as well. I mean, we know it's a relatively dangerous job. TV has to portray it probably inaccurately as a lot more dangerous than it is. But officers do get shot. Officers do get hurt. Um, how dangerous is the job for, to be out there on an everyday basis policing? It's I, I would say that, that I, I think there's two ways to look at it. I think there's the, the physical danger. Uh, I spent. I've been on a job 31 years. I spent 25 years in detectives and hundreds of drug raids and all those things and crashing doors and having fun. And sometimes afterwards, and it was usually afterwards that you think about it, uh, when you find the guns or, you, or the suspect says, you know, I would have done this if I could have gotten closer to it. Uh, in 1997, I was involved in a, a bank robbery shootout. And it wasn't until afterwards that you say, boy, that really could have ended badly. Um, the other side to look at, I think, is, is something that's a little more hidden, but I think it's the, the, the physical deterioration of a police officer, physical and emotional. Um, Dr. Kevin Gilmartin, who's, who's done a lot of, of uh, police training, talks about something called hypervigilance, when you're always on. Mm -hmm. And when you're on and the, the adrenaline's up, and that's not something that you bring back down easily. You could go from just a routine night to a baby choking to more routine, to a fatal motor vehicle accident, it's that up and down roller coaster. I think that's why police suicide is three times higher than, than the rate for uh, average Americans. So I, I, I look at it both ways. Let me ask you about that. There's some that say that the, uh, at least not the suicide rate, obviously, that uh, would be attributed to, to the officer's own hand often. Um, but with respect to some of the fatalities that happen in the line of duty, 
because they don't operate according to the book or their prior training. They, they make a mistake. Uh, they, I mean, if you make a mistake, it can be the end of the road for you in your line of business. It's, yeah. it's, it's cutting corners. There's no other way to put it on a lot of them. I mean, that granted, I mean, the ambush attacks in recent years, the increase in those, that I, you know, I can't speak to that because um, that just seems to be a phenomenon now that's increasing. But uh, as a whole, um, a lot of the officer fatality on the, do, uh, on the job uh, deaths it have to do with the fact that there's a corner cut somewhere. There is, and I, you know, and I'm, and I, I understand what Paul's saying about the drug raids because, you know, as recently as a few months ago, um, we were on one, and I, and I took a step back and I said, I don't like the way that this thing's going. Time out, time out, and you know, trying to get people, to, trying to get an entire task force to shift the way that they're doing things on the fly, and it, you have to, you have to be constantly vigilant. Mm -hmm. And, and again, that does. It comes with a cost. It really does. Is that you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the speakers that um, that we hear from as far as our, our academies go they, they use the they use the phrase that uh, you know a cop cooks in their own juices because of the constant stress that's on them and the fact that they're constantly looking around and what's in that and you know you go to a restaurant and you know where do we sit in the restaurant you know you sit <laughs> exactly in the back with your back against the wall why because it's just this be otherwise if you sit without your back against the wall where you can see everything you have this constant turning around it's <laughs> like who, who just walked in the door who's here you know what's going on um, and it's it's the way it's the mentality that you have to have it's just a survival um, it's an, an it's necessary and it's hard to turn it off uh, this weekend my wife and I went to New York and at oh, one oh, point I was my wife said what are you doing I said I'm watching that guy she said why I said he's gonna shoplift and what do you mean I said he's gonna steal something in a minute and pretty soon she asked me well, I said how'd you know he said it just comes with white and you can't yeah. turn it off and we watch him steal something out of the store and then run out the door it's just you know you can't turn it off we have to take a brief break so let's come back to us in a few minutes When you're ready to make a difference in the world, one law school can make a difference for you. The Massachusetts School of Law is where you learn to become a lawyer. As the most affordable law school in New England, you'll graduate with the most professional skills and the least amount of debt. Our small classes ensure a rich learning experience and a campus environment so special, our students don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law, we're ready to make a difference for you. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. Welcome back. Let's talk uh, about extraordinary events. I mean, we know the day-to-day -day policing is interesting and dangerous, but the extraordinary events like the Boston Marathon bombing or uh, joint task force that you oftentimes would engage in. Uh, I know our own uh, local community is involved in a joint SWAT team and, and the like. So tell me how that works, the cooperation between um, departments at the municipal level or, dep or federal and state agencies as well. I think it's, uh, I th there have been two massive initiatives uh, that I think have really rocked the, this entire uh, profession in the last 25 years. One was the community policing initiative uh, that Kenny brought up earlier. The, the second is, is, the, uh, is the introduction of regionalization with regards to services and the fact that um, you can supply one or two officers to a regionalized force at a minimal cost to the community while also making sure that the community has access to a tremendous amount of resources, whether it be a SWAT team, whether it be um, uh, you know, the mobile operations unit or investigative services unit aspect of it. Um, you know, right now, uh, we're in the middle of putting together a, um, a regionalized um, portion of the team that has to do with accident reconstructions and so on and so forth. Because with, the with, with, with more and more um, protective measures in your vehicles, and with you know measures that communities are taking now, luckily, knock on wood, they, the the uh, number of car uh, motor vehicle fatalities has gone down as well, which has resulted in a diminishing level of the skill of the people that actually get trained. So what this will do is it actually keep them up to date as well. So it, I 
I think it's been one of the most tremendous initiatives of the last 25 years. I look at 9-11 at for me as a watershed moment for uh, police and fire and EMS. Um, after bombings of 9-11, uh, if you look at some of the after studies, which are difficult for public safety because oftentimes, particularly when, when people die, when public safety officials die, there's a tendency sometimes not to look and, and to drill down too deep and get to the core of what <coughs> took place because we don't want to dishonor anybody's memory. I think after 9-11, what we found was, and the term that kept coming back was interoperability, the ability of departments that couldn't even speak to each other. Uh, there, were, there were departments uh, on 9-11 and the days afterwards that were in line of sight that couldn't communicate with each other because they wouldn't let the one other ones on their radio frequency. I think since then, I, I think my personal opinion is at the federal, state, and local level, there has been a tremendous move forward, a tremendous amou amount of information sharing, a real partnership. Uh, we belong to NEMLEC, which is the Northeast Mass Law Enforcement Council, counterpart to Ron's Metrolet. Um, it's 56 cities and towns that, to me, it's like an insurance policy. It's a phone call I can make and get a SWAT team, uh, a school safety team, uh, a, a police team of whatever it is that we're facing in my community. One phone call, I can get those resources. I think prior to, for us, prior to 9-11, I think there might have been some hesitancy on, on uh, the part of some law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just going to say, uh, my department is very small. I come from a very small community. It's about 4,600 um, population, and I am, am not a member of that. Actually, due to the cost, it was something I did put in my budget. The chief and I did talk about it earlier um, that I removed myself because of my need for, for manpower and uh, wanted to use that money for something else. So um, as anybody in sitting in before you can tell you that the first – like half hour, hour into an incident is the most critical. I have usually one, sometimes two officers on a shift, okay? Uh, we have a regional school in our, in our district, and um, we recently had an incident where a student brought a gun, albeit it turned out to be uh, a, a toy gun, but no one knew that at the time. And um, we called, we have, we have a radio system that we use due to our interoperability, and we were able to get nine um, you know, departments plus the New Hampshire State Police who came in with canine to assist us uh, on that event. Um, so what these gentlemen are, are members of is, is phenomenal. Um, I'm dependent on other agencies and, and the state police to come and help. But uh, for the department, the size of my department, where I have one, usually two officers on, um, it's, you know, it's critical that we reach out to area departments for assistance, so. Now, Kenny, you've got four kids, you told us, and I know Ron has his share, and we, you, all have, you all have your families and the like. There are those that say that being a good cop, the skills, the habits that make someone a good cop don't necessarily make them good parents uh, or good partners at home and all the rest of it. How, does, how do you keep, do you, do you, can you keep those lives separate? Can you keep those, um, the level of cynicism that has to come with your job as well as it comes with my job uh, down to the point where you can keep those healthy relationships at home as well? You can, I think, but you have to be very conscious of it. You have to, because like Paul said, you just resort back to a lot of things. Um, my kids, I have three daughters, um, one of the things is they say, you're always controlling. You want to control every situation. What, this isn't the police department. This is, you know, you're not because you're lawyers. You know, I want you to be my dad. I don't want you to control my entire life. And we worry because we know of bad people who've done, who've done certain things. I, I was a sexual assault detective for years. And so you gotta be conscious of it and there's gotta be some open communications and you have to be able to say, I'm wrong. You really have to be able to say, you know what, I'm, I'm wrong. And we spoke earlier um, about on the weekends and I'm with my significant other, you know, what do you wanna do? What do you want to do? I don't want to start dictating what we're going to do, how the day is going to go. It's important to me also because I, I'm relieved of my duties, I feel like, and I actually sit there and say, whatever you want to do, you please control the day. And it, it works out well, but you, very, you have to be conscious of how you must be all the time, and then when you go home to your family, they are not, you know, you, that they're your family. I have, I have three children, it's just a, my, my perspective on this. Um, uh, I was the parent that other parents would call sometimes and say, are you going to allow Danny or Megan or Shannon to go? 
You know, and if I did, then the other parents would let them do certain things. <laughs> <laughs> I was also the parent on field trips that got the most difficult kids, and they all behaved for me. That was a good thing as well. But just one perspective uh, in addition to this. Uh, my son is on the job now, oh, really? and I uh, just became a detective about a month ago. Congratulations. Thank you. He's, and he's doing a great job. Um, my wife has always been very supportive of my career, and, and, you know, I can recall packing up the car at Friday afternoon, ready to go to Maine for the weekend. I get a call from the informant. The drugs are going to be there at 8 o'clock. It's a hard thing to tell your family, we can't go till tomorrow morning. I, take, I think it takes a lot of work and, and some special efforts on the part of, of your family to understand that. And my wife tells me now that uh, she was worried about me during my career, but it's different now that mm. her son, our son, <laughs> is on the job. So I try well, he's a blood relative, as I tell my <laughs> wife. <It's>, uh, <laughs> and that is different. So, yeah, much different. So. Well, is that, I mean, that has to be it, right? Because if we look at uh, the suicide rate or the divorce rate, the rates are not, not healthy in your line of business. You really must have a supportive partner, and the kids have to understand that there, there, is, there are priorities here. They're, they absolutely are a priority, but with this job comes certain imperatives that are gonna, gonna get in the way on vacations or family dinners and God knows what else. Oh, there's no question there's sacrifice. There's, there is no question. Um, you, you know, oh yeah, the holidays, the Christmases, yeah. you know, you stop by in uniform to have Thanksgiving Day dinner for yeah. a half hour and then you're back out on the road. It's, you know, yeah. um, and the, you know, it's, it, it is, there's no question it's a family sacrifices. And it's, it's really is so tough to sometimes turn off the job. Like you'll go home, and it's funny because, um, you know, my daughter two weeks ago comes, uh, my drops off. Uh, can I go sleep over so and so's house tonight? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> who are they? Check. Is anybody run this by the sex offender registry? <laughs> <laughs> is, anybody, is there anything in that area? Like, you know, who are their neighbors? Yeah. Who do they talk to? It's like, nah, time out. No, you can't do that. And she's like, oh. and you can see the look on her face. Oh, I can't do that. And I, it's, but it, it, and it's because we see, you know, if you think about it, every single traumatic event that happens to any single person. Who's always standing right there eventually? Right. It's, it's a cop or a firefighter, or, but it, there's always a cop that ends up dealing with the aftermath That's of it. Right. And we basically, we get to see, oftentimes, the absolute worst of humanity. And you, it tends to skewer your you know, opinion of certain things. Sure. And you tend to um, be a little bit more hesitant to allow your kids to go, you know, well, I'm gonna go for a walk, ah, oh, well, wait a second, which way are you going? I don't want you going up that way, I want you going this way instead, you know, and, you, and it's like Teddy said, it's, you end up controlling and it's out of concern, um, and you try to put a check on that, but it, sometimes, it, sometimes you put a check on it, sometimes you don't. Are there services available within your departments or available to your departments for those officers that don't deal with the stress as well, that don't, that have these family issues or have some of the domestic violence issues that we see? Uh, prevalent among some police officers? Yeah, I think policing has done a much, much better job over the last 15 to 20 years. Rather than either kind of ignore the problem or pretend it doesn't exist, to actually proactively now look to see wh wh what's happening. Is somebody calling in sick where they weren't before? Yeah. Has the job performance dropped? I think that, that policing is one of, the, one of the only occupations, really, that I think a chief has to be as concerned with the work product while they're at work and the family life because it's one of the only jobs, frankly, that your off-duty conduct has an impact on your job. And uh, I, I know in Salem we have a very good EAP program and I have professionals that, that we have that I have the ability to refer some to and sometimes order somebody to have to go to. Yeah, you, I think, uh, especially myself, I, have, I only have you know, very few officers, but you know your officers and you know when he or she aren't just acting themselves, um, their attitudes changed or something about their work product has changed, uh, you know, they go from, from being very active to, to doing nothing day after day. Um, you know, you need to just look at what's going on with that particular officer. And again, we all have the EAP programs that are available and, and officers tend to be more willing to go to these programs than probably when we first started out. Uh, they didn't have them, but even if they did, we probably wouldn't have attended anyways. Right, right. Is that a significant part of your job? I mean, you're the manager now, right? So you have to not just watch the budget issues, but you've, and the personnel issues and the, the personal issues that, that your officers have, because obviously it can affect what they do out in the streets, which can affect everything that your department tries yes. to work for. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, you know, a, a stressed out officer. One stressed out, one officer that's absolutely stressed out and hits their limit is, it, it's, does it, the, the results can be disastrous. And it's, uh, in the early 90s, Chicago actually came up with a, uh, 
a computer program by the name of, uh, it was a system called BrainMaker, which actually started flagging at-risk officers depending upon certain criteria. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was, I mean, it was, it was quite controversial at the time, but there, was, there is a lot to be said about that. Is, is that it, are there certain red flags that are appearing and that it, it otherwise it needs to be dealt with and dealt with quickly? I think that one of the uh, things that surprised me most about being chief was the amount of interpersonal connections that people would come to me uh, with issues, maybe needing help. The other part of it is it has to be done in a confidential manner, a professional manner, and they're coming to you because they trust you. And I think that's something that if you can foster that trust with your employees, I think your organization is better for it. Uh, and as I said, I think that, that the state of counseling now, particularly with the peer counseling, uh, the, the counseling, Boston PD, opens their services up to any police department. They're expert, they have a great uh, peer counseling services, and I think it's incumbent upon a police chief to make sure that we get the best for our officers uh, for all the right reasons. Let's talk a little bit about diversity within the police uh, departments as well, because uh, one of the lasting images in, among the many I have from the Boston Marathon uh, bombings are the two women police officers with their guns drawn rushing towards the explosion and another image of a large black police officer directing people away from um, uh, harm's way. Having grown up in Boston, uh, the police officers weren't female and weren't often black uh, back when I was younger. Um, and it, it, it made me feel quite proud that we recognize that our departments have to be more representatives of the communities they face. But they still aren't where they should be. I see the academies come in here, they use our facilities for training, and they're still mostly young white guys. Um, some diversity, still not many women. Is it that women aren't drawn to it, that it's uh, not a job of choice, or that we have uh, qualifications that maybe we shouldn't have if we want a more diverse police department, at least with respect to gender? Lisa? I would defer to Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, it's hard for me because you got gentlemen are from large departments. Um, sitting here listening to your question, I'm thinking of all the applications that I receive, and I never receive applications from female applicants. Why? I can't answer that. Um, you know, I have <coughs> two female uh, officers that are uh, reserve officers that work for me. I recently. Um, with, with the blessing of the Board of Selectmen next Monday, she'll be appointed as a full-time officer. And um, you know, for a department that is comprised of seven full-time officers, to have you know, another one that's a female is, uh, to me, that's, that's phenomenal. You know, she's come a long way. She's been with my department for five years as a reserve. She's worked for a neighboring co community for a few years before that. So um, very capable. And I, I I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe, maybe these gentlemen are from. Okay, let me give Kenny last word because we're running out of time. How do we get more offices of color on our police departments, Kenny? Well, only speaking uh, from New Haven, which right. is a very big department. We had a lot of female officers and a lot of minority officers. But when I came on in '91, we had on the walls "Go home," and I, you can finish the rest. Um, and that was shocking to me. But that is one of the reasons why I, what I saw on the street that was. Uh, the injustices that was occurring to um, people who lived in areas that were economically challenged. The way to get people on is to s that they have to see other minorities on the force. Um, I was shocked when I came here. They said, I said, well, yes, I am the first person of color to be the chief. They said, chief, you're the first person of color to be a police officer in this town. <laughs> and I was, I was, you know, coming from New Haven where there's about 40% yeah. women and, and it's really diverse now. So the bottom line is um, things like this, you know, getting it out there, not only to be the first, but to come on panels and uh, so that people will see uh, that there are minorities in the force. Uh, quick comment, an MSL uh, student commented when I made chief, I know that guy. He makes me, now I feel like I could do anything because he knew yep. I was a personable person and now I made it to be chief of police and he's of the, you know, uh, uh, he's a minority also and he was, he was uh, enthusiastic that uh, we could uh, enter the field and go up the top and in New Haven that has been a common problem where even though there's 40%-ish, when you go up to the top ranks, it, 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 it is not. And that's always been a problem. On that note, we've got to end because we're out of time. Thank you for watching this installment of the Educational Forum.
We hope you enjoyed our look at the law, law enforcement, and recognizing those people who have the difficult job of keeping us safe. I hope we got you informed. Join us next time for another edition of the Educational Forum brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover.